1933, two New York newspaper men, weirdly both named Wayne, Wayne Weishar and Wayne Parrish, published a book called Men Without Money, The Challenge of Barter and Scrip. So they're especially valuable contemporaneous sources because they wrote the book in 1933, and that's the book. It's fairly rare, but we have a copy in the Baruch Library. So now that the country had tumbled into the depression, they wrote, <coughs> economically and socially, the barter movement in all of its phases is the outstanding story of the United States today. So that, that threw me, that quote, that in 1933, these two respected authors said the big story in the beginning of the Depression was the barter movement. I had never thought of it that way. It was, they said, the most moving and significant drama of the first two years of the Depression. So with banks closing, businesses failing, and money scarce, one million Americans had entered the barter economy. Barter was the ultimate evidence of commercial breakdown, when you think of it. So ironically, the two authors said, a capitalistic society of rugged individualists was by necessity adopting a cooperativism as socialistic as anything in the Soviet Union. Now barter, of course, was the, the ancient medium of commerce. In colonial, in colonial days, the Hudson's Bay Company and John Jacob Astor traded in furs. That was the medium of, of uh, commerce. A short-lived state that seceded from North Carolina in 1784 and called itself Franklin decreed that a coonskin was worth a pound of sugar. But that was in colonial times. In a barter economy, people trade what they have for what they need from somebody else. A farmer trades bushels of corn to a shoemaker for a pair of shoes. But in a complex society, making such matches was cumbersome. What do you trade if you are, say, a lion tamer or a mirror silverer? So amid the shortage of legal tender, municipalities, organizations, and businesses came up with their own unofficial medium of exchange, makeshift money called scrip. Some of it was paper mimicking treasury bills. Some was wood, literally wood and nickels. Others, sales tax tokens, were tin or aluminum squares or, or, bottle, or bottle top cardboard. And Pismo Beach, California even issued clamshells as money, rest well cabins. <clears throat> Maybe that's why hipsters say something costs 12 clams. Just like in colonial America, paying in buckskins uh, gave rise to calling doctor, dollars bucks. Now, curios like clamshell currency were often retained quickly by collectors, um, so they didn't circulate much at all, kind of defeating the idea. Now, one little town in western Washington state between Seattle and Portland made an ongoing business of scrip. Tenino, named for an Indian tribe, Tenino, Washington, suffered the closing of its only bank in 1931. The next closest bank was 15 miles away. So depositors were encouraged to assign to the Chamber of Commerce 25% of their frozen bank assets in exchange for script certificates that local merchants agreed to accept for purchases in amounts of 25 cents, 50 cents, one, five, and 10 dollars. Now what happened next was really legendary. The printing was done, the printing of the script was done at the local newspaper, the Thurston County Independent, but along with paper, some of the 27,000 certificates were run off on thin strips of slice wood, two rectangles of spruce, three and a quarter by five and a half inches with paper in the middle. Word spread quickly with motorists detouring to Tenino to snap up the wooden money. In the end, of the $10,000 in script issued, only $40, only $40 was actually spent. Almost everybody wanted to hang on to it, which kind of defeated the purpose again, but made Tenino world famous in numismatics. And to this day, wooden money is printed there for souvenirs. So that's what it looked like, wood. According to one leading scholar, Lauren Gatch of the Department of Political Science at the University of Central Oklahoma, by 1933, 
The amount of scrip in circulation in today's valuation was as much as $14 billion. That's a picture of some of the scrip certificates. Um, and it's, I know it's too small to read, but it's, a, it's an explanation of who would accept that, the merchants, and what it was good for, what it wasn't good for. Obviously, um, it was not, it didn't have the same uh, liquidity and ability to circulate as official money. Now, there were five basic types of script. One was so-called reputational script, scrip, and a lot of people make that mistake, they call it script. Um, reputational script issued by corporations and organizations and backed by their solid reputations to meet payrolls or purchase goods. Another was bank and financial script exchanged as certificates between financial institutions or issued to depositors in lieu of cash. A third type of script was particularly exotic. Certificates that required the application of stamps each time they were exchanged. When a su sufficient number of stamps had been affixed, the currency lost its value, adding an incentive for its prompt use. <clears throat> Yet another type was barter and self-help script exchanged in cooperatives where farmers traded crops for harvest help or city dwellers swapped services for goods. Now the fifth and last type of script was tax anticipation notes. Cash, cash strapped municipalities paid their employees with certificates backed by revenue that was due the municipalities. Now in addition, some government entities issued square or round tokens of tin, aluminum, or cardboard to pay sales tax on very small purchases. Now, this I found was really particularly interesting. During the Depression, even pennies were valuable and scarce. So 12 states and a variety of localities issued tokens as cheap as one mil, one-tenth of a cent, to pay small sales taxes. Some were printed on milk bottle caps. We'll have some pictures later. <clears throat> the Treasury Department ur urged Congress to approve the, the official federal issuance of these small fractional coins for sales taxes. But the bills died without action. Not surprising. Treasury ended up ordering the states not to issue their own sales tax currency and mostly it died out. But as for scrip, the question was, was it legal? Uh, it was a gray area. As long as issuers didn't claim to be minting actual money, legal tender, Washington was willing to look away. And given the dire circumstances, scrip was legal enough. Uh, the position the government took, well, it may not be legal, but it wasn't really illegal. Anyway, as the authors uh, Weishar and Parrish wrote, there was no alternative. The choice wasn't between 1920s prosperity or some great new economic system. People just needed to do something to stay alive. <clears throat> A wave of utopian experimentation produced the Natural Development Association of Salt Lake City, a cooperative with its own newspaper. Uh, implementing a barter economy, the NDA, according to the authors, had more power than 50 trainloads of communists. It put together people who needed each other's products and services, but with one striking condition. Members were required to subscribe to Christianity. I'm interesting, back then. <clears throat> In some way, this mutualism drew on the cooperative ideas of the pioneering French anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who famously declared property is theft. How his egalitarian society would work was never completely clear. Proudhon was prosecuted but escaped conviction because the jury could not understand his theories. Fascinatingly, one of the earliest advocates, advocates of self-liquidating scrip and a harsh critic of the monetary system was Charles A. Lindbergh Sr., father of the aviator, who served in Congress for Minnesota from 1907 to 1917 and opposed American involvement in World War I, an isolationist like his son. So I, my good friend Mike Candell of the Times and CNN, a financial contributor may be known to the museum here, uh, asked me, what makes you an expert on the crash and script? And I had to admit nothing except, like every journalist, I did some research. 
Uh, I became interested in the subject after leaving the Times and joining Baruch College as a distinguished lecturer. Now, Baruch is named, of course, for the financial mastermind of FDR, uh, who graduated for, from what was then the original City College in 1899. And here's an image of our namesake as a boxer. Shows how vigorous he was. He wasn't just a pencil-pushing financier. Uh, much later, I myself attended City College uptown in Harlem in its wonderful free tuition days. Now, after my Times career working in Baruch's Newman Library, I started a blog on one of our historic uh, archival collections, the papers of the Institute of Public Administration and its longtime director, Luther Halsey Gulick III, who lived from 1892 to 1993. That's Gillick. Now, with the generous help of Carnegie Corporation of New York, we got the chaotic collection of 700 overstuffed cartons out of storage, his collection, into Baruch for processing and digitization. That's how we got the cartons. That's where we eventually found the script and cartons like that. And that's how we organized them later. And as I said, one of the great surprises we found was Luther Gulick's collection of script. Now, Gulick, it turned out, was not just the leading theorist of government management and a counselor to presidents Woodrow Wilson, FDR, and Truman, and, city, and he was a city administrator for, for New York's Mayor Wagner. He was also an obsessive collector of posters, charts, maps, and script. Now, Gulick is a worthy subject unto himself. Uh, he was born, as I said, um, uh, 1892, before the automobile, airplanes, movies, radio, television, and lived to see men landing on the moon, cell phones, and the internet. What a, what a span of life. He was there for the two great New York City zoning debates of 1916 and 1960. His pioneering Bureau of Municipal Research institutionalized budgeting and auditing, trained America's first professional public servants, <coughs> challenged Tammany Hall's corruption, and promulgated government for reform in America. And you can all read about it on our blog, called An Adventure in Democracy. I hope that name is easy enough to remember. You can Google it, it's all over Google. An Adventure in Democracy. Now starting in April, and we're gonna get back to script. Starting in April 1934, Gulick, fascinated with all the workings of government, sent letters to municipal officials around the country asking for samples of their script, paying in some cases with postage stamps. Gulick paid 10 cents for a wooden nickel. Now, this, you probably can't read this, but this is, these are letters that Gulick sent that we have in the files to municipalities all over the country asking for examples of their script, which, script, which he was willing to pay for. And he got a, a very uh, forthcoming responses. In Chicago, the Municipal Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada sent Gulick a list of places issuing stamped script and tax anticipation notes from Oregon, Maryland, Wisconsin, Nebraska, and New Jersey, Michigan, and Tennessee. Gulick followed up promptly, as his correspondence file shows, and the script began pouring in. Now, these are some of the sales tax coupons I mentioned before. Uh, those are the bottle cap cardboards. Those are the little tin tokens. You see, it's one and a half mils. A mill is a tenth of a cent. Um, now, one case... <coughs> was particularly interesting, we found in the collection. Let me see, is there another? There's another one. Uh, that's the one on the left is from Oklahoma with uh, Will, um, uh, Will um, why am I blanking his name? Will Rogers, uh, Wooden Nickel, um, and um, I don't know if that's the back side of it. Anyway. Um, now, one case was particularly interesting. Upton Sinclair, the great muckraker and author of The Jungle, and an 1897 graduate of, Link of uh, City College, ran for governor of California in 1934. He, he was the, the Bernie of his time. He was a socialist, unashamedly, and his slogan was epic, end poverty in California. Uh, there he is, and that's his famous book, The Jungle. Now, to discredit him, red-baiting enemies circulated fake script called Sink Liar Dollars. The bill said, endure poverty in California, <laughs> and good only in California and Russia. 
um, they try to shame him. And you see on the top it says, not very good anywhere. Upton Sinclair, governor of California. Well, he never was governor, but uh, the red currency. Now, the red baiting didn't only target Upton Sinclair. Uh, unpopular sales taxes were denounced as communistic with these mocking tokens circulated. So a fifth of a cent sales tax on the front is his face red. Donkeys, so the, the symbol of the Democrats uh, tarred as communistic. So to carry this forward into the digital age, you may be thinking, well, what about the current forms of script if they are? What about Bitcoin? What about Facebook's new Libra? Are they digital forms of script? Like this, the Zuckbuck. Um, and in a sense, uh, perhaps they are considering their alternative forms of paying for goods, services, and debts, but uh, they really deserve their own program with truly expert speakers, so I'm not going to go into cryptocurrencies. Um, if we're looking for lessons to carry forward, um, I think one is the role of government in protecting us from future October surprises and other calamities. Um, we live in a cynical time of disdain for public service, um, but Luther Gulick symbolized faith in enlightened leadership, those with the knowledge of how to implement government ideas for the public good. With this example, uh, with the end of prohibition, Gulick worked on John D. Rockefeller's Jr.'s 1936 study on liquor reform called After Repeal. Now, you can imagine the return of legal alcohol was an administrative nightmare. Every state had a different idea of what kind of liquor should be, or spirits should be permitted, beer, wine, hard, hard liquor, uh, when they could be sold, where, restaurants, home, the hours, Sundays. Um, so it had to be sorted out, and Gulick helped sort it out for the liquor study. And then he wrote this, which I'll read you, which I find really one of the most uh, eloquent affirmations of the role of government and something I think is particularly timing, timely today and I don't think I have to spell out why that is. Gulick wrote in 1936, the real work of government is not to be found behind the Greek columns of public buildings. It is rather on the land among the people. It is the postman delivering mail, the policeman walking his beat, the teacher hearing Johnny read, the white wings sweeping the street, the inspectors, dairy, food, health, tenement, factory, on the farm, in the laboratory, the slaughterhouse, the slum, the mill. It is the playground full of children, the library with its readers, the reservoirs of pure water flowing to the cities. It is street lights at night. It is thousands and thousands of miles of pavement and sidewalks. It is the nurse behind, beside the free bed, the doctor administering serum, and the food raiment and shelter given those who have nothing. It is the standard of weight and measure and value in every hamlet. All this is government and not what men call government in great buildings at capitals. And its symbol is to be found not in the great flag flown from the dome of the capital, but in the 25 million flags in the homes of the people. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Uh, that brings me to the end, and I would love to open it up for any questions, uh, comments, and interchange. Thank you.